about uh, activism against HIV in uh, New York. What uh, was it in the past and what's uh, at present? Well now, because of the work of activists of the past, the medications do exist for people who have HIV. But in the United States, we don't have a healthcare system that's coherent. So different kinds of people have access to the medication and then there's people who don't have access. And it's usually based on where you live and whether or not you have money and what kind of health care you have access to. So it's profoundly uh, unjust and unequal right now in the United States. What about the stigma? Yeah, well, HIV stigma persists no matter what. And it's kind of a mystery as to why, because there's a lot of diseases you could get today that are a lot worse than HIV. But because it's queered in the public mind, you know, it's always associated with anal sex and with needles, there's the stigma is maintained. Now, globally, governments are increasingly criminalizing people who are HIV positive for no good reason. There's no health reason behind it. And so we're seeing that even in places like Canada, there's profoundly inhumane laws against people with HIV. So the stigma is reinforced by the state in many cases. <laughs> But the scientists now say U equals U, that means undetectable equals uh, untransmissible. Could this uh, change the stigma? So far not. Um, so far people with HIV are being criminalized even if they are virally suppressed and therefore cannot infect anybody. Because the stigma is not informed. And so that, unfortunately, is not related to the reality of, of the illness. What about the attitude of the Trump administration about all these issues? Is there a change if you compare with Obama's time? Well, the Trump administration is trying to dismantle whatever little health care Americans have, which most people got under Obama. So it's making it worse for people with HIV, much, much worse. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. This is the launch of the Queer Liberty four-day program. Welcoming Sarah Shulman, wherever you are. Yes. Yes. Hello. 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 Welcoming the amazing Sarah Shulman um, to London. Um, our organising team, Jeremy, Oli, Arkan, Anna, and so many other legends in here, thank you so much for making this whole program happen. Um, the theme of the four days is the fact that strong and stable my art. We're living in more inequality than in the time of Dickens. And if Sarah Shulman's incredible um, wealth of work on so many issues, we don't have time to go through them today. This taught me one thing, is that all injustices are connected and that we can win when it comes to tackling inequality. And the film United in Anger tonight has been such an inspiration. By, by the way, my name's Dan. Uh, <laughs> It's been, such a, it's been such an inspiration. We reformed um, ACT UP in London in 2012 after seeing the film. Uh, we've got some legends in the room who are going to be on the paddle after who were in ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power in the 80s and 90s. And it's what's called the second silence now. The first silence being the 80s and 90s, the second silence being now because of the threats to the National Health Service, um, which we are not going to let those bastards in Parliament um, do. So um, this, um, I just wanted to 
say thanks to everyone here, thanks to the organising team, um, but primarily, I know I'm, I know a lot of people in the room, but I don't know everyone, and I know there's so many incredible committed people here who want to change the world that we're in at the moment, because uh, we're not going to let the bastards rob everything from us. So, in the spirit of coalition politics, um, I just want to ask everyone to speak to someone they've never met before, um, and say hello, and say if there was one thing that you wanted to change in the world, there's no right or wrong answer, there's no, it's nothing small or nothing big, there's no right or wrong answer, that you wanted to change in the world, that you don't want to leave the planet without changing, what would it be? Whether it's LGBT related, healthcare related, anti-racism, whatever, like what do you want to change in the world? So speak to someone new that you've never met before and say, what do you want to change? Yeah, makes sense? Organise. Organise any institution, any establishment. Uh, this is not a workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, over here. Self love. Self love. Yes, yes, Just in, how would you flesh that out a bit? <laughs> Self-love. Everyone to ownership of their self. Yes. So if you know yourself, you won't spill all over everybody else. <laughs> yes, mate. <laughs> Thank you, Leswana. To self-love. And Leswana is one of our panelists after um, from Act Up Women's Network, um, who recently and is continuing doing the Act Up um, Women's Catwalk for. Um, Home resistance and catwalk for power. Catwalk for power. Cat for power. And um, so lucky to have you on the panel after. Just to run through what we're going to do tonight, uh, we've got the f we're going to Arkan's going to talk about the rest of the week's program. Uh, we're going to have the film United in Anger. We're going to have a ten-minute break, um, and then we're going to have a Q and A with Sarah, um, really focusing on how we can win, how can, how, how we can win the battle. Um, and then we've got Amelia, we've got Naswana, we've got Andrew, we've got Jonathan, we've got Maz, and we've got Mix on the panel after, really reflecting on the, on the film. And they're all incredible LGBT healthcare activists and writers who are piercing through the kind of fog that we're in at the moment. So hopefully we'll leave the building tonight with some new friends, new ideas, and new ways that we can challenge the system. And, uh, have a great time as well. Over to Arkan. Okay. Okay, also, you haven't mentioned that we're both wearing denim, so this coordination, first of all. Um, okay, really quickly. So, tomorrow we have a keynote lecture with uh, Sarah at SOAS. It's starting at 7. It's uh, Let the Record Show, a political history of ACT UP New York. Sarah Shulman reviews the roots of AIDS, activism, and feminism, black power, and civil rights from the forthcoming novel to be published in 2020. So we still have a couple of tickets available, so you can go onto the Quaytals London website and you can check that out. And then on Friday, it's uh, the event we have at the ICA, which I'm super excited for. Uh, I curated an event with uh, five of London's amazing queer activists. We have Travis Alabanza, who is legendary for many reasons, of course. And we have Lewis Burton, who co-founded Inferno, which is a really good queer space, like a very safe space. Good techno, good people, and good fashion as well, which is always very important. And then we have uh, Avia Sarah Day, who is from Sisters and Co. Uh, they were recently actually with Angela Davis. I was literally like, oh my god, I saw a photo of her with Angela Davis, I was literally crying. Like, I'm so excited for her to come and talk a lot about like coalitional politics within the context of Sisters and Co. and direct action. And then finally we have the uh, Center for Transnational Development and Collaboration, which is uh, two Palestinian women talking about uh, migration, identity, linking, uh, displacement with more accessible forms of speaking about displacement. And yeah, that is happening at ICA Friday at 6.30? Yeah, 6.30, yeah. And then finally, again at the ICA on Saturday, we have the Realm of the Recognizable. So Sarah is joined by artist and writer Matthias Wegner for readings and conversations on Shulman's work and their shared friendship and engagements with Kathy Acker. So for the last two events, for the third and the fourth, you can find all the tickets on the ICA website. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you there. Really looking forward to it.
And then lastly, lastly, um, there's a few clipboards at the back, um, because this year is obviously the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprisings. And I say uprisings because our friend Ted, and we've got Nettie, and we've got Stuart in the audience from the Gay Liberation Front who started Pride. It wasn't fucking Tesco. It was these legends. <laughs> in the back. Did you know BAE Systems are the primary sponsorship for B uh, Pride in Surrey this year? What the fuck? Uh, like, an uh, arms company are sponsoring Pride. What the hell? They sell weapons to Saudi Arabia to be used to bomb Yemen. They're terrible. They were at Pride in 2016 or 15. They had the red arrows flying over. We all have to be against this idea of having any sort of militarization be endorsing our sexuality, our gender identity. We Queerness is not about legitimizing the nation state. It is about subverting the idea of belonging only being for some people. It's for all of us. So, yeah. Fuck BAE. Literally, fuck them. That's it. Fuck them. And Blackpool Pride? Yeah. Okay, so sorry, and Blackpool Pride. So please sign up to the Gay Liberation Fund. Please sign up to ACT UP. Um, and also, I just the last shout out before the film. I went to the most incredible protest the other day by Tasha and Maz. Maz will be speaking on the panel from Nabab Prabat, which is the Bangladeshi LGBT network. Very relevant to the area that we're in. Thank you to Richmond for having us. Thank you for Tower Hamlets. Um, and the queer Bangladeshi London network which is booming and demanding justice for their friends who were killed three years ago but we'll hear more about that later so yeah make new friends enjoy the film and we'll have a good chat after thank, thank you, you so much <laughs>
in a third of the time. We are simply asking the FDA to do it quicker. We found out, at least within those few years, if you could identify an obvious problem if you could get the media on board about it, if you could get two to three hundred active people sitting in at a very particular target and making it very, very uncomfortable for the powers that were, you could affect very, very quick change. Then last four days of activism, what's the purpose and what's the lesson we can learn from the past? Because we, here we have also an amazing activist from the USA, from the ACT UP. She has been for a long time in ACT UP New York and uh, she has um, produced a film about what uh, the uh, activism of the past has been. Yes, we're so lucky to have Sarah Shulban here. Sarah Shulban has been such an incredible inspiration for me. She's prolific when it comes to creating social change. Um, she's a, a novelist, she's a writer, she's an activist, she's a filmmaker. Currently in there, they're watching United in Anger, which is such an inspirational film when it comes to HIV activism. And how we can win when it comes to injustice. How in the 80s and 90s, people risked their lives who were also dying because of the AIDS epidemic, because of pharmaceutical greed and government inaction, took to the streets and fought for antiretrovirals. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here today. Um, so, um, we are here particularly with a the theme of coalition building, coalition politics, queer liberty. What does that mean in Britain? This film is about America, but what does this mean here in the UK when we're in, living in such times of hostility and isolation and depression? Like depression's on the rise, um, anxiety's on the rise, suicide's on the rise because of the really hostile, explicitly hostile environment that we're living in. So the whole event series, tonight at Rich Mix, tomorrow at SOAS, and then the Institute of Contemporary Arts on Thursday, Friday, Friday and Saturday, is about how we can build radical coalitions, humanise and understand each other across the different issues, racism, sexism, HIV, you name it, all the injustices, and build radical coalitions so that we can win. And this is what the film United in Anger really shows. And uh, it's important also the presence of the Bangladeshi community. Yeah, one key example of coalition building that we've got here tonight is the Bangladeshi LGBT network, which is growing. We had a demonstration outside the Bangladeshi High Commission, which you did an amazing film of, Paolo, a couple of days ago, um, demanding justice for Hull House and Rabbi, who were two incredible queer activists who started the first LGBT newspaper in Bangladesh, who were killed. Maz was, had to flee, fled to London, and has become part of Queer Tours and Act Up Network and is doing incredible LGBT, HIV healthcare work for the Bangladeshi community. We're in Tower Hamlets, like 80-90% Bangladeshi community and we need to support the queers within that community to fight for their rights. So that's just one example of how we can build power in community. In Brunei? Oh, Brunei! So basically, what's been quite interesting over the last little while is you've got key examples like uh, Brunei, Brunei and Chechnya who are killing queers. So we've had demonstrations outside the Dorchester Hotel, outside the Russian Embassy to confront and challenge the Sultan of Brunei and Chechnya for killing queers. I mean in Chechnya they're starting concentration, they have concentration camps. So both what London needs to be is an active community when it comes to solidarity across the world. We need to look after ourselves, look after our own, simultaneously be inspiring when it comes to genuine, effective solidarity. We have read that also Saudi Arabia has beheaded gays recently. Yeah. Um, the list goes on when it comes to global homophobic persecution, but we've got to recognise that it started with us with the 1533 Buggery Act by Henry VIII. Britain cannot blow their fucking trumpet and like pat themselves on the back when it comes to LGBT rights because we have to be, if we're radical, the etymology of radical is root. We have to get to the root of the problem. But Britain has uh, um, close ties to Saudi Arabia also about the military. Well, exactly. We've got a, as Sarah Shulman so incredibly exposes is the apparatus of power. How does it maintain itself? Like it's easy to look at the individual issues of LGBT or 
uh, gender or race, but what are the things which pay the bills, which keep their wallets fat, like the arms industry, for example. So it's all very well and good for Britain to say, oh, you Saudi Arabians, you're terrible for killing queers, but we're still funding them with a whole military industrial complex. So really, we've got to look at deeper at the, the apparatus of power and powerlessness and how we can challenge that with our activism. And uh, that's why also you protest against uh, Pride, the official Pride of Yeah, Man. damn right. Oh, I protest against Pride in London because I am a queer and I have integrity. And uh, there's no integrity when it comes to a Pride sponsored by an arms company like BAE Systems who exists to sell weapons to countries which persecute queers. There's a huge contradiction in there. And it's like, it's, it, it, you're not being real to yourself if you're not... Um, looking at the root of the problem, and the root of the problem is the military industrial complex. That means that the mechanisms of power, of capitalism, of the arms trade, of the prison system, which keeps the marginalised marginalised and keeps the elite elite. We need to challenge that by challenging the root cause of the problems, such as the arms arms industry, the pharmaceutical companies, which the United in Anger film is about. So we need to respect and love ourselves and realise that we have the power and the critical consciousness to challenge that. Arkan and uh, Olympia, let's talk about uh, these uh, days, these uh, four days of activism. The purpose? So the purpose of these events that we're doing is to uh, draw attention to the importance of intersectionality and coalition in fighting against the increase of uh, gentrification within the context of London and the UK and also how the Brexit narrative has really divided the country and how that's impacted you know the queer community as minorities within the context of cities such as London and also other places within the country so yeah. Um, I think for me the key issue is that um, I guess yeah with the rise of fascism but also with like sort of increasing neoliberal inequalities, uh, in some ways these are bent on individualizing us as human beings, as consumers, as, as producers, um, and in some way the power of coalition politics works and, and is precisely lies in, in kind of undoing these divisions and these silos um, with which we are thought, we're, we're kind of forced to think of issues as single issue struggles rather than as uh, group, struggles. group struggles, interconnected mm -hmm. struggles as Erkan was saying. Um, so I think especially in today's context but also building on the history of ACT UP um, then coalition politics may play and I think definitely plays a really important role in like fighting the kinds of inequalities we are seeing today. Yeah, I mean the whole point of uh performing and embodying coalition politics is to understand that every single struggle is interconnected to each other. It's the idea that one person who faces a form of marginality will inherently be linked to another who does as well. And it's kind of about creating that universality of a narrative and it's about understanding that collectively a form of gendered sexual racial empowerment comes with us understanding that it's better when we're united together and we try and achieve for this rather than all of us trying to do it individually. That doesn't take away from the fact that there are certain people in our community who obviously uh, require more representation, who require more attention, who require more support. So I guess for me the whole point of getting involved in these events is to also uh, fundamentally prioritize people of colour and to prioritise gender queer narratives and trans narratives because at the end of the day, you know, HIV positive, trans people, people of colour, working class people, we're the ones who face the brunt of oppression and the brunt of marginality within society, be that in the UK or in any other context globally. And I think the point of coalition is not only just about us understanding each other's narratives, but about us also using our own position to be able to lift up those within our community who do not have that voice, who are not appreciated and respected and who do not have their voice heard in the same way that other counterparts and other allies might. You are both very young, but this struggle against HIV, this activism started a long time ago when you were not even born in the 80s. So what's the lesson from the past? I think the lesson from the past is that sort of context change and power shifts 
but in some ways the struggle has always been the same and it's it's always this idea of like unleashing and releasing releasing power and finding the system which kind of is works to keep us separate and works to sort of oppress uh, marginalized communities and I think actually one of the things I've learned the most from sort of participating in events but also like being sort of in contact with ACT UP is precisely like the power of I mean as Dan was saying before like the power of uh, intergenerational kind of learning and it's something that doesn't happen in a lot of communities I think it mostly happens in like queer communities um, and it's something that is is an amazing tool to sort of to, to learn from in terms of like fighting contemporary struggles I think definitely I think one of the important things to also remember is that when we look at for example when we're watching this film and we see the experiences that the people who came before us had I mean, we literally have to fight, we have to put our bodies down on the line on a daily basis to even have our voices heard in any way possible. And I think the biggest lesson we can take is that we perpetually still have to put ourselves on the front line. What I learned from those who came before me is that if I do not go out and if I do not shout and if I do not say, I need my liberty, I need my freedom, I need my empowerment, it's not going to come to me and it never will. Gonna give it to you. So intergenerational you know, experience teaches us that you constantly have to fight for that. If you sit there and you expect it to come, it won't come. And in fact, what you have a lot with people in our generation is they think that we've achieved yeah. liberty. Yeah. You know, this idea of pride, this idea of us all marching the streets together, drinking alcohol, performing this form of like acceptance and tolerance. It's, 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 yeah. it's inaccessible for certain people. It's inaccessible for people of color. It's inaccessible for people who are not global citizens of the North. And I think that in that sense, it's a recognition and a reminder to us that like, we're not free until all of us are free, and yeah. we're not free until every yeah. single one of us can yeah. feel the form of empowerment within yeah. our politics. Yeah. And that's what the generation before teach us, and that's yeah. what we want to teach yeah. and remind our generation yeah. who are too busy on Instagram, mm -hmm. too busy in fashion, too busy yeah. doing this, to too really busy focus. A asking for freedom instead of demanding it, asking instead of rather fighting than and, and, and getting it for Good. ourselves. Exactly. Um, Coming in from the end of our destruction, where those with the luxury of times have tested. I imagine what it would be like if friends had a demonstration each time a lover or a friend or a stranger died of AIDS. I imagine what it would be like if each time a lover, friend, or a stranger died of this disease, their friends, lovers, or neighbors would take the dead body and drive it with a car 100 miles an hour to Washington, D.C. and blast through the gates of the White House and come to a screeching halt before the entrance and dump their lifeless form on the front steps. You know, I'm getting old. I mean, I'm going to be 70. Okay. So, 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 like, kind of, yeah. So, it's difficult. Uh, sorry. Yeah. It's, it's kind of difficult to kind of continue to remember what uh, what I did. I don't know. I just, I've, I've become a media whore, basically. <laughs> Oh, all right, yeah. yeah. I mean, so sort of, I was, I was sort of um, a, an early diagnosee. So I was diagnosed in in October 1982, um, and my hospital number at the Middlesex was London One, L One. Um, so yeah, so I've I've lived with it, around it, you know for a, a long while um, and it's been an extraordinary journey mm -hmm. and you know those early years were you know, were difficult but nothing in comparison to uh, to what you know they had in America I mean we had and, and this is something that we really have to remember and Dan's alluded to but we have or had a national health service mm -hmm. um, and that's something that really needs to, you know, be um, looked after and sort of, you know, taken care of. And, you know, we need to fight these bastards that are privatizing it and selling it off. And they want to make it, they want to make it, 
it part of their trade deal with, uh, with Trump's America? No way. No way. I mean, you know, but sort of it, it needs for, you know, all of us to sort of fight and, you know, maintain vigilance. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> I'm not impressed that I have to follow after him. <laughs> My name's Lisuana. Um, I have been living fabulously with HIV for 16 years. Um, I'm currently doing the project called Catwalk for Power, which is empowering ladies and wonderful women to embrace their sexuality and just strut their stuff. Yeah. It's not about, you know, sex and the things that you think of when it comes to a catwalk, but it's about them just being empowered and having a face and having that space to just show that they are who they are and HIV does not define them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else do I do? Loads. <laughs> but I love ACT UP and I love ACT UP women. When is, yeah. when is Our next one is in Brighton, and it should be September. In September? Yeah. It's a, there's a Facebook page, Twitter, everything. I came into HIV work in 87. I was living in a rehab, and the staff were treating everybody... And they were quite mean. I mean, it was supposed to be mean. We were supposed to be fitting it to... Uh, society again after years of addiction and I noticed that some of my peers were quite ill and in fact we were all forced to be um, forced into a room and without any real consultation we were all tested for HIV. Anyway afterwards I started noticing that people were visibly sick, there was a whole struggle about whether they should get opiate pain control. I jumped up and down and got very angry and in trouble because people, I mean, you know, when people start to get so physically, obviously sick, one of my girlfriends had um, Bell's palsy, it was, yeah. And she was in so much pain, and they were denying her the codeine. It was like it was time to break the door down. Unfortunately, I hadn't been involved uh, or even known about ACT UP at that point. I was still in this uh, place. And, um, but, you know, so I would do things like break of structure, structure being like what I was supposed to be doing all day with everybody and give people massages. And then as soon as I left, I became involved in HIV uh, volunteer work and became a drugs counseling officer actually at Terence Higgins. And um, that's how I met my life partner who's now gone. And of course got really involved with ACT UP. And I think the thing about this film for me, um, mostly is, uh, yeah, there were a lot of people in it that I knew from um, Act Up New York. But what's really important for me, before I get into this grief, is that I... It's about fearlessness. It's like, you know, in the light of the most unbearable suffering, people stepped up to the plate in a way that, you know, we can't even begin to imagine. And I feel, you know, really honoured that I was there for a bit back then. And... Um, you know, that we were called whores and sluts and queens and whatever when we went out and marched for needle exchange in New York back in the day. Anyway, now we've got a recurrence of all that, which I'll probably mention later in Glasgow. So anyway, thanks for listening. Yay. My name's Amelia Abraham, I'm a journalist, um, known Dan for quite a few years, been writing about um, some of ACT UP UK's actions, um, and I'm desperate to write about cattle power at some point <laughs> soon. Um, and I've just spent two years writing a book called Queer Intentions, which um, is a, is a, was a journey across LGBT culture in the West, looking at assimilation politics and the mainstreaming of LGBT culture. And I think watching this film, um, in terms of the work I've been doing, I suppose, made me think that there are a few questions um, that the film raises that are still really relevant questions today. Um, and one of them is, like, um, how far have we actually come? 
So this is obviously all happening after like the gay liberation movement, and it just shows you that progress doesn't always move in a straight line, which I think is something that we're having a lot of good conversations about for bad reasons at the moment with what's been happening in Brunei and um, people talking about LGBT relationships being on curriculums in schools and Trump's um, trans military ban. So we think we've made progress, but we, we haven't always. We haven't always. Um, and another question was. Um, that it brought up for me was, I think, like, what does it take? Like, what has to kind of arrive on your doorstep before you become politically active? Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking to a lot of married couples for, for the, yeah, I was talking to a lot of married couples in the book about why they got same-sex married, and and it it kind of made me stop um, being so anti-marriage because I thought, wow, this is a really lovely thing, but also, you know, a lot of them said, oh, I used to be an act up, or I used to do this, and I, d I don't really do that anymore. And so one of the questions in the book is like. At what point are we allowed to sort of kick back and enjoy the rights we've won? Um, and then the third question was, um, what was the third question? The third question was, um, oh yeah, like who? The really important question from the film, which is, whose lives are more important, um, both in society at large, but I think this film really brings out that idea of um, also within LGBTQ plus and ally communities. Um, there's still a lot of inequality and something that I was researching in the book a lot is why some types of LGBTQ rights or lives are more palatable or acceptable um, than others. Um, I just want to give you a brief uh, note about me and myself. So uh, I have been living in London it's two years and five months before that I was in Bangladesh and I had to leave my country it's almost like within 24 hour notice and I came to the airport in a bulletproof car with US Embassy protection it's because I was one of the pioneer LGBT activists in Bangladesh yes. and uh, the Islamic extremist group ISIS they killed two of my friends, close friends, because they, they published a magazine, LGBT magazine. So yeah, that's me. And I'm still surviving. I'm still asking for justice for my friends who sacrificed their life. And today, this movie, being honest, I didn't have any clue what I'm going to talking about tonight. But after, uh, this is the first time I saw the movie. And it really inspired me. It's really motivated me. I don't know, like, there, it seems like this movie has got some supernatural power, and it came to me. Yeah. So what I'm going to do, like, yeah. So, and if you dream, always big dream. So there is no act up group in Bangladesh. And one day, I'm going to make sure that there will be one act up group in Bangladesh. So that will be inspired to do that. And uh, there is no, basically, I'm going to have another workshop in the South Asian community and raising the awareness about the HIV things. Uh, very soon, and I'm going to have another workshop in the Bangladesh. It could be online workshop or something with the support of Act Up London. So that's what I'm going to do, and it's all because of this movie. And Sarah, we are really honored to have you tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. These are all things that we need to do together. And what I notice about setting up these projects is that people really do start criticizing each other. Uh, intersectionality is really important. And I think if people start saying we're going off the point because um, you know we're talking, uh, let's take the Extinction Rebellion, we're talking about the extinction of the species, the extinction of the planet, and then people start bringing in anti-captors and the people say, oh, you're going off the point. No, you're not. This is all holistic. It's all intersectional. Race, disability, gender issues, all these things impact on each other. And that's the message that I would like to see taken from this movie as people work together intersectionally. Thank you. Yeah, right. I'm Sarah Shulman, I co-produced the film, and this film came out. Um, 
It came out in 2012. I'm now writing a book that is a history of ACT UP New York, and it's going to be about 800 pages. Wow. I'm halfway through. I've interviewed 188 surviving members of ACT UP over 18 years. Wow. wow. Uh, and actually tomorrow at 7, I think, I'm yeah. going to be presenting some of the findings of, that I've cohered about, you know, how, why, and the big question was why was ACT UP successful to the extent that it was? And I think I do know the answer, so if you want to find out, you can come tomorrow. So, uh, it's at seven. All right. With PEP, you know, which is the, like a morning after pill. Because of all of this stigma on women preparing to have sex, and some people feel that these, the programs about PrEP are really on a gay male model and may not be what is, I don't know what your opinion is about that. Everything is centered around the gay, well, the man model. So trials are all dedicated to men. Um, if, even if the trials that have been done and are successful, they're sent out of the country to countries where they're given to ethnic women where it won't work um, so yeah it's yeah. not working and as far as I can see we're still stuck where <laughs> it was fighting for women and the other thing that I saw was women don't stand alone it was always women and women and less uh, income women and this women and we're not just having our own platform Mm -hmm. We're actually working harder because we have to support everybody else as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons that every woman with HIV and ACT UP has died is because women were much got much sicker before they went for treatment because they're always taking care of somebody else. In the U.S., women with HIV tended to be poorer and have, and as you know, it's it's pay for play for health care in the U.S. Um, and uh, also, there was a period where women were seen as vectors of infection instead of as people with HIV who need rights. Mm -hmm. So when there were questions about transmission to children, for example, the, the child or the was, considered, was given priority in terms of testing and all of that. So trying to get a woman be seen as a human being with HIV it's a, was a long battle and is a long battle. The other issue is um, you know, in North America, female to male transmission has never actually been proven. And that has related to circumcision. So the idea that female sex workers were somehow endangering male clients, this went on for a long time and was used to oppress female sex workers when actually they were the ones who were endangered. Yeah. But, but once again, women being seen as vectors of infection. So there's just been misrepresentation from the beginning. Mm -hmm.